The Tom Woods Show, episode 2294. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. We've got our old friend Mark Skousen back with us today, but we're going to be talking a bit about intellectual history today rather than stocks and the market these days. I know Mark has been pretty satisfied with how things have gone since the conversation he had with John Wolfenbarger on our program. That is a separate matter, Mark. We're not getting into that or we'll never get to Adam Smith. We're having Mark on today. First of all, let me give you a proper introduction. I apologize. Mark is the editor of Forecasts and Strategies, an investment newsletter he has published for over 40 years. He's taught at numerous institutions, Rollins College, Columbia Business School. He's at Chapman University right now. I think he teaches just because he enjoys doing it. I don't think he does it for the money. He teaches because he likes doing it. And there's something very, very endearing about that. But he's written a whole ton of books And Mark, in particular, we're talking today, March 9th, 2023, about Adam Smith. And why are we talking about Adam Smith on March 9th? Well, that's because it's the 300th anniversary of Adam Smith's birth. And March 9th is the pub date in 1776 of the Wealth of Nations. And we're talking about someone who has had, according to all the surveys, more impact as an economist than any other economist, including Karl Marx and John Maynard Keynes. So I have in my room my totem pole of economics, and I have Adam Smith at the top spreading his wings. That's the Austrian in Chicago school, by the way, spreading their wings of Adam Smith. And below him is Keynes representing big government and the welfare state and Karl Marx, who represents the totalitarian central planning, socialist state. And I think Adam Smith has won the day, although with an asterisk, because there are many examples where the Adam Smith model has not not succeeded, unfortunately, with our government policy. But in many ways, he has been a big success. So I think it's this is so appropriate. I'm giving a series of lectures around the country and also in Scotland on his 300th anniversary of his birth on June 5th, I'll be at the Palmer House, which is where Adam Smith, that was the last uh, residency before he passed away. And so I'm giving a lecture there as well as Glasgow University. You know, Glasgow University is doing a week-long celebration of Adam Smith and bringing in experts from all over the world, and I'm, I'm going to be one of them. So I'm just very pleased, and I think as believers in laissez-faire and free market economics, we need to do more to celebrate who I consider the father of free market economics. I want to start actually by jumping into the thing that most people, if they're not super acquainted with Adam Smith, would nevertheless know about him. And that is, in the wealth of nations, the image of the invisible hand. Now, that term is not used a whole bunch of times in the text, but It is the image that has stayed with so many people. And I think that the concept of the invisible hand is very often when it's described by people who don't like Adam Smith, it's very poorly described. It's described in caricature. It's described in a way that has nothing to do with what he meant by the term. So what was he trying to get at with the idea of the invisible hand? First of all, the invisible hand is mentioned only once in The Wealth of Nations and only once in the Theory of Moral Sentiments, his earlier book. And so there is this debate on whether the Invisible Hand Doctrine is a marginal concept, metaphor, or is it central? And Dan Klein has pointed out, and others have pointed out, that people have discovered that it's right in the middle of both volumes. And so there is this theory that Adam Smith played a little clever game on us, and put it in the middle of both of his books to indicate this is a central concept. But basically, I like to use the Leonard Reed example of I pencil. You have everybody privately doing their part, putting 
parts of the puzzle together and nobody knows except the final product that they're producing a pencil. So it's a bit of a, a miracle, if you will, as, as Leonard Reed said and Milton Friedman said with iPencil and his book, Free to Choose, that this pencil was created by private, self-interested businesses and individuals bringing together all these different resources to produce a single pencil. And as I tell my students, no one in their lifetime can produce a pencil from scratch, starting with raw commodities. You just can't do it. You can't put together the, the wood, the paint, the eraser, the metal, the lead, everything that goes into something as simple as the pencil, let alone a cell phone, to create this product. We need the cooperation. And free enterprise capitalism is often viewed as a competitive dog-eat-dog type of model when, in fact, there's probably more cooperation than there is competition in the capitalist model. If you use the stages of production model that the Austrians use and I use in my own textbook, the stages of production to produce products. So basically, private individuals are all working together for their own self-interest with no intention whatsoever to benefit the general public. But the end result is they are led by an invisible hand to benefit the general public with the production of pencils and all kinds of other products. It's an ingenious concept that's used by economists across the political spectrum in a very positive light. The incredible genius of the competitive model that Adam Smith advocated and developed in The Wealth of Nations. Frankly, I think it's a great image and it's a brilliant and extremely important idea. In a way, it was the thing that kind of moved me toward being a free market person was this very concept. And in particular, the idea that, for example, if there are super abundant profits in some industry, then what will happen is that will draw more people into that industry. That'll push the profits down and then things stabilize. Or if there are losses in an industry, people voluntarily leave the industry because who wants to make losses? And then again, it stabilizes. And just that idea that you don't need anybody directing people to say, well, we need more pencil factories now, or we need fewer, but that people through their own self-interest figure out that I, I shouldn't produce any more pencils because indirectly they figure out that people don't want so many. That is such a profound and amazing insight and it's such a beautiful insight. And the fact that that's how society works without central direction, I think that's one of the central insights into social life is that right there. So I love it. I love that idea. You know, and Tom, one of the things that's interesting here is that in Adam Smith's time, this was a very controversial concept that somehow the chaos of the market can develop into this self-governing, stabilizing system where supply and demand move toward equilibrium when they're out of equilibrium. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading what other people have said about Adam Smith, both pro and con. And it's interesting how Benjamin Friedman, for example, at Harvard University, has written a recent book called Capitalism, you know, about the rise of capitalism and Christianity and so forth. And he points out that back in those days, it was considered vicious. The term vicious was used. It was a vice for allowing people to do whatever they wanted to do, that this was very dangerous, that a free market would be a free for all. And this is one of the revolutionary natures of Adam Smith's defense of commercial society, that commercial society tends toward self-governing results and spontaneous order, if you will. And there's lots of really great quotes about how the natural direction of things leads to harmony and benefiting all the members of society and not just the capitalists. It was actually quite critical of the mercantile model because that was a form of artificial involvement in the economy. He makes a distinction between what is a natural development of the economy versus the artificial pressure, top-down mercantilist model that he rejected. And that was the basis of this concept of laissez-faire. And in fact, if you don't mind, I'd like to just read to you a little quote 
that kind of summarizes, in my opinion, Adam Smith's model. He actually wrote this before the Wealth of Nation. He wrote in 1759. He said, little else is requisite to carry a state from the lowest barbarism to the highest degree of opulence. But peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural course of things. Now, that's the quote that you may have heard, others may have heard. But what's interesting is the statement he says after that, which is often not quoted, so let's quote it here. All governments which thwart this natural course, which force things into another channel, or which endeavor to arrest the progress of society at a particular point are unnatural and to support themselves are obligated to be oppressive and tyrannical. So Smith has a, let's say, very realist and not a utopian understanding of the nature of governments. Although, of course, he also has that famous passage where he's not naive about what private business might get up to if left to its own devices, if it had the assistance of the state. Well, in fact, the whole mercantilist model was basically crony capitalism, where yeah. you had all of right. these top-down, all these big businesses, East India Company being an example, where they got special monopoly privileges, and they seldom get together except to raise prices and to take advantage of her, their monopoly position. So, I mean, they talk about the Das Adam Smith problem The Germans did, but there are lots of these examples of of paradoxes where here you have Adam Smith defending the commercial society and talking about all these wonderful benefits from the commercial society. And at the same time, he's constantly criticizing business people. And that's largely because they're involved in this mercantile top-down state where the state is constantly intervening on behalf of business people to move it in this unnatural way. So people need to really understand the distinction he's making between the blessings of the commercial society, which him involves three elements, justice, freedom, and competition. And if you eliminate the competition, this was one of the great discoveries by Adam Smith to recognize the competitive model does a lot to minimize to moderate the passions of greed and uh, selfishness, the, the business frauds and so on. It doesn't eliminate them. We still have them today. But competition allows people to say, hey, I got a bad deal from this business. I'm going to go to this other business. And it, it kind of forces business people to be honest and more forthright and more transparent. I would say if I were to try to classify Adam Smith in terms of like what were his contributions. Let's say if I were to try to characterize the key contributions that Adam Smith made, if I were to do that as an economist, the contributions that I would identify would be a bit different than how I would classify or describe Smith purely as an intellectual historian. So in other words, as an intellectual historian, I wouldn't dig into necessarily what he has to say about money or topics like that. I would look at the big picture and I would say, It's two primary things. Number one is what we've already talked about, that society, in effect, can more or less commerce can direct itself, and we don't need anybody centrally planning it. But the other thing, I think, would be also this idea that you've described, that in fact, there's a harmony of interests in society, that it's not right to think of us as being necessarily pitted against each other because we're all antagonistic interests you know, the young versus the old or the the countryside versus the city or industry versus agriculture or the rich versus the poor or whatever, that that's not true. Or likewise, that competition necessarily has to mean that we're at war with each other. That to the contrary, there are, in a way, as Bastiat said, economic harmonies at work in our free interaction with each other. To my mind, those are the two major contributions to the understanding of not so much of the economy, as of the free society. If you look at the title of his book, The Inquiry into the Causes and Growth of the Wealth of Nations, the focus is on expanding the pie, so to speak, not how you cut up the pie. Although he does have a lot on distribution and he didn't always get it right in that respect, his criticism of landlords and that sort of thing. But if you look at the stages of production model, this is the great Austrian contribution 
the marginal revolution that occurred in 1870, where Menger and von Barbrick and these other Austrians, Mises and Hayek and so forth, emphasized the stages of production. And in the stages of production, like I pencil, land, labor, and capital have to work together. They cooperate together. They're harmonizing to expand and achieve economic growth and a rising standard of living. Even the division of labor that Adam Smith started off in the very beginning with the pin factory or the nail factory producing all you know 18 different stages of production to put this nail or this pin together, it's a cooperative effort, right? And if you don't cooperate, you don't finish the product. So I think that is really important. It was later on by Malthus in particular, and Ricardo, that really tried to emphasize distribution and got him into a lot of trouble and led to the Marxist revolution who divided people up into workers versus capitalists and so on. I do like, and I know John Mackey, CEO of Whole Foods Markets, or the former CEO, the retired CEO, put together in conscious capitalism, the stakeholder philosophy. But there's a lot of Adam Smith in the stakeholder philosophy, the idea that workers and landlords and capitalists and investors work together to produce a product and they all benefit from it. There's a lot to be said for that. And there's also a lot to be said for the market in an energy crisis, for example, and there's a shortage, prices go up. And what is the response of the market? Well, the market is to produce more, which brings the price back down to equilibrium. And it all works together in kind of a what I call a Newtonian economics, because remember Adam Smith called his model, I didn't call it laissez-faire or capitalism, free enterprise capitalism. He used the term system of natural liberty and occasionally system of perfect liberty. He's imitating Newton. Newton was all the rage as he was going to Oxford University in Glasgow and so forth. And he had this system of natural philosophy and the Newton's three laws of nature, gravity, and so forth. And he came to specific results as a result of it. So Adam Smith kind of wanted to imitate that. And he came up with the term system of natural liberty. And he basically confirmed what Alfred Marshall proved 100 years later when he drew the supply and demand curves. And you reach a point of equilibrium through the actions of entrepreneurs and capitalists and workers to achieve a stable, self-governing model where people could benefit. You and Gene Epstein had a debate some time ago on whether Adam Smith should be considered the father of free market economics. What's your case for that claim? Well, like in most debates, I usually lose the debate or I lose the battle, but I think I've won. I wasn't going to bring that up, Mark. I wasn't going to say a word. You you said that, not me. (laughs) You know, the thing is, it depends on what kind of audience you have. I mean, I think if you interviewed or if you did a survey of most libertarians, and in fact, when you look at the free market economists, there's only a very small minority who fit into the camp that Adam Smith was not the father of modern day economics that it should be go to Turgot or Cantillon or whoever you think might be this. I One of the quotes I had in the debate, and I think this is a very important quote, Jean Baptiste Say, the great French economist said, before Adam Smith and the wealth of nations, we never thought there was a political economy. That kind of settles in a lot of ways the impact or the influence that Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations had. He had an immediate impact on British economic policy. Just as an example of free trade, Adam Smith's most famous contribution is in free trade. And that has taken the world by storm. And if you look at the decline in tariffs, quotas, and so forth, and interference with globalization, it's pretty dramatic. And Adam Smith in one part of his book, suggested that tea, he suggested to the British government that, that the tariffs on tea, which were 100, like 112% of the price of tea, and it created this huge black market. And smuggling was a very big problem. And William Pitt Jr., who was the prime minister at the time, 
he lowered the tariff from 112% to 12%. And guess what? The smuggling business completely disappeared. So there's a lot to be said for the influence and impact that Adam Smith had, and particularly laissez-faire. And I do, I do want to mention one thing that I was unaware of during this debate that I had at the Soho Forum several years ago. And that is the discovery of Wesley Mitchell, his lecture notes that he gave in the middle of the Great Depression. Mitchell was really interesting because he was at Columbia University and he was the man of no theory. He believed in being totally objective and just looking at the information and so forth. And he he established the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, which is the foremost research organization by top professional economists. And he did this 80 pages, published the notes of his lectures, and he made this incredible remarks about Adam Smith, suggesting how strongly he viewed his views on the wealth of nations and how Adam Smith clearly represented this new philosophy of laissez-faire. And um, let me just read to you what Wesley Mitchell wrote about Smith and the wealth of nations. He said, Adam Smith came to the conclusion, quote, that the wealth of nations will increase most rapidly if every person is allowed the fullest opportunity to decide for his own individual self what is the best way to use his labor and whatever capital he possesses. In other words, the best policy for governments is to interfere as little as possible with the occupations and investments of its citizens. You see how bold and sweeping that argument is from Adam Smith's eyes. Everybody, quite obviously, is pursuing his own interests. It is evident in his own local situation that he is a better judge of where his economic interest lies than any statesman could be. Therefore, the individual will get on best if he is left alone by the government. This is the great argument for laissez-faire. And you know, when I read this, I said to myself, wow, I think even if Murray Rothbard or Gene Epstein had seen this tremendous 80-page case for Adam Smith and his advocacy of laissez-faire, even they would have changed their mind and saw the beauty of this Adam Smith model that he had created. Now, granted, this was a imperfect model, had all kinds of problems with distribution and marginal theory and so forth. And it took the French laissez-faire school, the Austrian school, the Chicago school. There are a number of economists who improved upon the model that Adam Smith built. No question about that. I mean, Carl Menger talks about how he was in a frenzy he thought, I have discovered how to keep the Adam Smith model going and not tear it down and have to rebuild the whole structure, which is what the Marxists and the Keynesians and institutionalists and the socialists, that's what they have done. They want to just tear down the Adam Smith model and build their own model. So there's a lot to be said here for this Mitchell contribution. It was a real eye-opener for me when I saw this, and I have to thank Lanny Evenstein from UC Santa Barbara, who told me about the lecture notes of Wesley Mitchell, which, by the way, are public and which I'm going to be putting on my website, mscousin.com, so that people can go and directly read this without having to buy the book. Hey, everybody, quick sponsor message. We're still in the first quarter of 2023, so it's not too late still to try to implement those New Year's resolutions and become the person you want to be in 2023. How about being the most impressive person in the room? Not a know-it-all, that's different. A charming, knowledgeable person people wonder about. How did that person get to be so interesting and know so much about so many things and be able to participate in and hold conversations on such a wide array of topics? Well, the answer is the Blinkist app. Now, you don't have to tell them that that's what you're using, but that'll be what you're using. Blinkist takes thousands and thousands of nonfiction titles over dozens of subject areas and breaks them down into 15-minute chunks. So in 15 minutes, I can get all the key takeaways from the entire book. I can read it or I can listen to it while I'm driving in my car. So as I'm driving in my car, 
If I have even a 30-minute drive, I can be mastering two books. How about that? Sometimes Blinkist will take a bunch of books on a similar topic and bunch them together so that it's easy for you to consume all of them one right after the other. And one of them that I've been doing is the 14-day personal growth challenge. I find that books like this will have three or four really great insights, but otherwise it's 10 hours of my time wasted. I'd rather just get the three or four insights in the 15 minutes, and that's exactly what I'm getting thanks to Blinkist. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Do you want to say something about the chapter in Rothbard's, you know, Murray Rothbard wrote a two-volume History of Economic Thought, you know this well because you commissioned it. <laughs> yes. So he has a volume, Economics Before Adam Smith, and he has Classical Economics. He's not as impressed by Smith, and he focuses on the shortcomings of Smith, which, of which there are some. And I think some of them you kind of more or less acknowledged, but I think the reason some people want to point to the French liberals or point to Richard Cantillon or whoever else is that the entrepreneur is very important in economics, and he is largely absent even today in much of economics because so much of it is dealing with with status static states of long-run equilibrium. I was just talking to Sean Rittner about this, that if that's what you're going to focus on, then there's nothing for the entrepreneur to do. Everything's already been allocated. There's nothing for him to move around. There's no need for forecasting. We've already reached this end state. But what's interesting for economics is the process of getting there, but we never reach it. But the process is what's interesting. And if that's absent, then that's a major, major missing ingredient. Yeah, I think that Rothbard did make some vital criticisms of Adam Smith, but I think it's unfortunate that Adam Smith did not use the term entrepreneur. He ended up using the word undertaker. And of course, that has a double meaning in the United States but he meant to undertake enterprise yeah. and so forth. So there is there is entrepreneurship in the wealth of nations. It's just not emphasized as much as it should be. And again, these are examples of where the Austrians and others have done a great job to really emphasize that. Listen, I could criticize Austrians. I could criticize Ludwig von Mises in human action. He leaves out Say's law. There's nothing about Say's law in human action. So does that mean I could write a story saying, you know, Ludwig von Mises was a terrible economist. He was a disaster. He never created anything that's new. And he left out major omissions like Say's law, which is critical to understanding growth theory. You can do this kind of thing looking back. And I think that's one of the problems here. One of the things I found interesting, and, and you're right, I did commission Murray Rothbard to write this history of thought. He was supposed to write a Heilbrunner alternative, 12 chapters, and do it in a year. And, and he, he only got through halfway through his project, his uh, Schumpeterian tome, as we call it. And there's a lot of great insights. Don't get me wrong about Murray there, but I think he was just totally wrongheaded about Adam Smith. And the proof of this is the fact that Every great quote that Adam Smith is famous for is left out of this chapter, chapter 16 of, of Rothbard's book. Let me just give you an example of the quote I gave at the beginning of our discussion of little else is required to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence, but peace, easy taxes, administration, tolerable administration of justice. That's not quoted, but listen to this. Adam Smith's often viewed as utilitarian and, and not a believer in natural rights. But listen to this. To prohibit a great people from making all that they can of every part of their own produce or from employing their stock and industry in a way they judge most advantageous to themselves is a manifest violation of the most sacred rights of mankind. That's not in Murray Rothbard's chapter. And how about this? Every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is less perfectly free to pursue his own interest in his own way and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men. I mean, this is a 
one paragraph summary of his system of natural liberty. That's never quoted in Rothbard's book. So I kind of look at it, and I said this in the debate with Gene Epstein, and I kind of look at it, if you get up too close to Marilyn Monroe, one of the most beautiful women in the world, and you get so close that you see the pock marks and the scars and the pimples and so on, she's ugly. But if you step back at a distance, you see a great beauty. And so I think it goes back to what you would say, where what is the big picture? And the big picture is that Adam Smith, with all of his flaws, still made a great contribution, revolutionary, as Milton Friedman said. And by the way, irony of ironies, Murray Rothbard's mentor, Ludwig von Mises, wrote an introduction to the Wealth of Nations for Henry Regnery in 1966 for Regnery's publication of the Wealth of Nations. And in that introduction, he glorifies Adam Smith. He says that this is a great work and that we can learn so much from it and it is revolutionary. I mean, it's extremely positive about Adam Smith. So I just think that I don't know what caused Murray, although he he is famous for doing this sort of thing in history, for example. Have you read his book, Conceived in Liberty, particularly? Yeah, of course. Well, volume four What does he do? He takes a totally contrarian view that goes contrary to almost every historian that I've read about his views of George Washington, Benjamin Franklin. He castigates them. I mean, he thinks Charles Lee should have replaced George Washington as the general. Charles Lee, I mean, he was the most divisive general you can imagine in the war, and yet he is Murray Rothbard's hero. And I can't find a single historian who agrees with him on any of this. And of course, Charles Lee was captured anyway. So he he never had a chance to prove himself, but he was very bitter and cantankerous and very argumentative. He would not have made a great general like George Washington. Well, regardless of the, the ins and outs of that, (laughs) <laughs> Much of the time when you're telling the story of U.S. history, it's necessary to be a contrarian because everybody's gotten all this wrong. I mean, how many you have to be a contrarian about the presidents of the 1920s. You have to be a contrarian about Hoover because everybody misunderstands him. You have to be a contrarian about FDR, Truman, LBJ. <laughs> I mean, you know, so I don't hold that against him. But I think his point was simply that in these volumes, which I think the volume we all wanted if I'm speaking at least for myself, was the third volume. I want to hear what he has to say about the 20th century economists. You know, I want to hear his views, not just on Alfred Marshall, but I want to hear his views on Schumpeter and on Keynes in particular. I mean, a a Rothbardian full-blown analysis of Keynes and the general theory, which, you know, you get implicitly here and there in Man, Economy, and State, but I mean a full-blown, no-holds-barred treatment would have been so intellectually satisfying, and we never did get that. But I think his argument is, here are a whole bunch of great ideas that have been presented over time, and there really were some pre-Adam Smith ideas that if only we had hung on to them, we could have avoided some of the unfortunate detours that have been taken since then. But I, I don't want to dwell on this aspect of it, because there's other stuff to say about Smith. For example, most people know about the wealth of nations, even if they, you know, may even may have had to read some of it in school, but far fewer know anything about the theory of moral sentiments. And I bet if you gave somebody a test and said, give me a couple of insights from the wealth of nations, they could at least kind of grope their way through some sort of an answer. But if you were to say to them, tell me about the theory of moral sentiments, I don't think they'd be able to say anything. What do you think we ought to take away? What would be the big picture takeaways from the theory of moral sentiments? The theory of moral sentiments is a dry book. I frankly, have to admit, I struggled getting through this book. And its main point is a good one, though, and it's an important thesis that despite our selfish desires that we do have an interest in others, benevolence, sympathy, if you will, for others. And he gives lots of examples of that sort of thing. And I actually think that there is no problem, Dasada's problem that the Germans raised is, well, you have selfishness as the 
self-interest as the big virtue and the wealth of nations. And then in the theory of moral sentiments, it's all about sympathy toward others. And if you think about the commercial society, you really are required to think and have sympathy toward the customer. And so it really is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you're going to be a successful business, you have to have that in mind. And that includes employers and so on. It really is, in my, in my view, the stakeholder philosophy that John Mackey emphasizes. So I think that is the main takeaway from that book. Now, you do have some economists that have pointed out that the theory of moral sentiments was written about a time when we largely lived together in a community where you knew everybody. And when you know everybody, then the basis of trade, the basis of relationships is who you know. And everybody knows everybody in a small community, right? But the wealth of nations is now talking about where everybody's a stranger. He's talking about big city life. When you transfer from the small community where you know everybody to the big city where you don't know anybody or very few people, then self-interest becomes a much stronger perspective on this view. So there's lots of ways of looking at the relationship, the evolution, if you will, of these two books. Forgive my poor short-term memory, but did we say anything about your literal book that's over in Edinburgh right now? No. So several years ago, I purchased a copy of the first edition of The Wealth of Nations, which is now worth a quarter of a million dollars or more. It's a beautiful copy. In fact, it has quite a provenance that used to be owned by Rothschilds. It used to be in the Glasgow Library. It could have been the book that Adam Smith donated to the Glasgow University. There's no autograph of Adam Smith in the book. He didn't do book signings like you do today, but it's a beautiful two-volume set, and it is on leave. With my permission, I granted a five-year loan of the book to the Pamer House, which is owned by the business department at Edinburgh University. So it's on display there. And whenever they have an event, they bring it out and open it up. And it's great because when I go there on June 5th, I'll be giving a little discussion about that particular edition. And it's just, I'm a big believer in buying rare books, but you need to put them on display. I mean, what's the point of buying a rare book and putting it in a safety deposit box for nobody to see? So I'm delighted to have loaned out the first edition. So if anybody goes to the Palmer House, they can request a viewing of the first edition. I should also mention that my own book, The Making of Modern Economics, came out of Murray Rothbard not finishing his history of thought. As you said, it would be great to know what his views are. By the way, he gave a whole course that's been recorded on the history of economic thought. So he does cover. Keynesian economics and Schumpeter and the Keynesian revolution and the Chicago school and all of that is in his recorded lecture notes. So who knows, maybe like Adam Smith, they they took the lecture notes that he wrote on jurisprudence and that's now a volume. So maybe they could do that with Murray. But in my own case, I did want to do a one volume history of the great economic thinkers. And I was heavily under Murray's influence during that time period and wrote a rather negative view of Adam Smith, like he did in my book, Chapter One, It All Started with Adam. And then after reading Ludwig von Mises' introduction and discussing it with my wise old uncle, Cleon Skousen, who said the Adam Smith model of the invisible hand is inspired of God, it forced me to re-examine my position. So you know what I did is I picked up the Wealth of Nations and read it cover to cover, the whole thousand pages. And when I was finished, I put the book down and I said, you know, Murray missed the boat on this. While he has some good things to say, he missed the big picture. And Adam Smith is truly a heroic figure. And his system of natural liberty deserves to be the major thesis of my history of thought. 
It's called The Making of Modern Economics. And I make Adam Smith and his system of natural liberty the hero, the protagonist. And I discuss those who support him and rebuild and improve upon the house that Smith built. And then I have chapters on Marx and Keynes and the socialists and so on, how they tried to tear down and often left Adam Smith for dead, but he was resuscitated. And in the end, it has a positive ending with the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Central Molino system. And what was most pleasing to me turned out quite a coincidence that the pub date for my Making of Modern Economics, the very first edition in 2001, was March 9th. And I went through all kinds of changes to get this book out, and it turned out to have the same pub date as The Wealth of Nations. So I would like to think that I was accurate, I was correct in viewing Adam Smith as the hero, and it all came together that I could actually tell a story. All histories of thought prior to my book were just well, this economist said this, this economist said that. There was no running thread. And I was able to create a storyline and an actual plot and heroes and enemies and a good ending in the, my book, The Making of Modern Economics. So if people are interested, they can get this. It's now in the fourth edition published by Rutledge, which is Hayek's old publisher, by the way. And you can get that from the publisher, from Amazon, but also from scousenbooks.com where I sell my books at a discount. So it's a much more reasonable price at scousenbooks.com. Well, I'll make sure there's a link to that Please. at tomwoods.com slash 2294. Well, it sounds like you're going to be traveling quite a bit between now and June 5th on the subject of Adam Smith. So I hope you have safe travels. And I suppose maybe you'll spend a little time this summer in Florida? Yeah, I need to spend at least half the year in Florida to keep it as my residency. So I will definitely be there and perhaps we'll get a chance to get together again. I look forward to it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, before we wrap up for today, I want to tell you where I'm going to be. March 16th, if you live in Central Florida, as I do, I'm having an informal get-together for dinner, drinks, and socializing at a place called Fredster's in Maitland. You can get the details by just looking it up online, Fredster's in Maitland. We're going to meet there Thursday, March 16th, 6 p.m., and we'll enjoy some dinner, drinks, live music. Fred is a friend of mine, the guy who owns the place, and I'd really like to see the place be even a bigger success than it is already. So I want to spread the word about it. So I hope you'll come join us. But if you are planning to join us, would you please just drop me a line so I can keep count and let Fred know what he should expect? So you can drop me a line at tomwoods.com. You'll see the contact page. You can click on at the top and that will reach me just like an email. That's for my Central Florida people. Then April 1st, no, it's not an April Fool's joke. I'll be in New York City as part of the Take Human Action Tour speaking there. And then May 27th in Denver. For the same tour, I will be speaking there. You can get the details for those events at TakeHumanActionTour.com. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.